All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Taming the, Be the Beast, a practical guide for taking over a Drupal project. All right, so first, uh, hi there. I'm Matthew. Um, I, I work at Symmetris. I've been with Drupal since 2010. Uh, I'm passionate about technology, science in general, and uh, I would say I'm a cautious optimist. So uh, I try to see the, the, the good side of everything, but uh, I, I pay it myself. All right, and I work uh, with Symmetris here in Montreal. So what's, what's the story here? Why, we, why are we talking about the beast? So you have uh, your guy, your business guy, the uh, business development uh, doing sales at your company that uh, barges into your office saying, good news guys, we have a new client. He, want, he wants us to maintain his current website and he wants us to add new features. And then you, are, you, you have your typical uh, Drupalist, your typical developer is here. Uh, Maxim, that uh, first, what he's thinking is, man, I love to build new stuff. I, I don't like to take over uh, other people's website. I don't want to do cleanup. I don't want to fix bugs that I haven't uh, introduced myself. So he's not too, uh, too enthusiastic about the project. Uh, and then the work starts. What's in the box? Huh? So when we open the hood of a new website, this is where we uncover the beast. So the beast is the analogy for what you're picking up from a previous, uh, previous provider for your clients and uh, you're never sure what you're uh, gonna, gonna see opening the box. So what does it mean for you? It means maybe the code is 30 versions behind, um, maybe the core is hacked, some patches were applied but not documented. Maybe the application sends emails to clients on every action. When you update a node, when you run cron, maybe everyone receives an email and you have no way to know about it. Uh, maybe configuration are oddly managed. Um, when I say oddly, uh, you remember Drupal 7 features. Maybe some stuff are in code, maybe some stuff are not. Uh, maybe configuration are not managed at all. Maybe deployment is hazardous, so you cross your finger each time you push something to production. Uh, and what it means for the clients, it means that maybe the initial core uh, updates and country of updates you're going to do on the website uh, will cost them thousands of dollars because um, you don't know what's in the box. Maybe uh, in the process the site went down 10 times, even for a short period. Uh, that could mean something for your clients. Uh, maybe content, content was lost, maybe worse, maybe they lost customer during that process. So, uh, and, and it can mean that first improvement to the website arrives 20 weeks later. So the time to market may be very low because you don't know what's in the box. So you, know, you understand that it's all about fear. And what I'm going to talk about today, uh, I'm going to talk about managing fear. And I think that's the one thing we want to do when we pick up someone else's project. We want to make sure that we don't live that fear. We want to manage our own fears and we want to manage the client's fears. Because maybe if you left from a previous uh, provider, maybe that's because uh, you had a bad relationship with it. All right, let's breathe. So now that we went over the hours that we can find in the box, Let's see what we can do to mitigate that. It's all going to be okay, I promise you. <laughs> you don't know uh, why and how it got like that. You don't know why that Drupal website you inherited is as bad as it is. Uh, and maybe it's not. Maybe it's just little, little stuff that, that uh, downs you, but you don't know why it is like that. You do know that you need to find a path forward. I'm going to help you get there. All right, so it all starts with the work estimate. I know that there was a talk uh, just before me in that same room about uh, estimating work. Um, often we're good at estimating um, new projects, new website, the ones that we will build from the ground up. Uh, we're not necessarily so good to estimate the work involved uh, in taking over a new, uh, an existing project. So here's an alternative scenario. 
uh, Julien, our business guy, uh, wants everything for next week because it's what he talked about with the clients. And of course, Julien is a real person at our company and is more uh, sensible than this. He, he, <laughs> he won't promise stuff like that, but it's for the sake of the argument. Uh, and Max, again, our enthusiastic footballist, um, have only one requirement or two. You first need to understand what is taking over, and, and then you need a fully functional and safe local and test environment. You want to make sure that everything is going to do from now on is, is able to do it locally on his own computer uh, in a safe space and to deploy it on a test environment that is uh, sensible uh, with what the client has in production. In reality, what he wants, he wants comfort. He wants to walk away from that fear of every new thing, every little CSS adjustment is gonna be, he is gonna deploy in production will break the whole site. He wanna live that comfort. Let's see how we can do that. All right, first step, hunt down documentation. You are on a mission to find everything you can put your hands on. Uh, it could be an old uh, RFP, request for proposal. So in that original document, uh, you're gonna find maybe um, uh, API integration that you didn't think was in the project. You can find automation that you didn't think was in the project. Uh, you wanna see if the client or its past provider has functional or technical documentation about the, the product you're, you're and everything. Uh, you want to see if the client has a backlog to a backlog of bugs of, of, of bug fixes to uh, to address, uh, and maybe the old provider as one as well. Uh, original repositories. So if the old provider is kind enough to give you like the .git folder of their previous project. It could it could help you understand the the journey they went through. Uh, and then you want to understand what's going on with with uh, the um, kind of the um, uh, the the whole project, not only the technical things, but <coughs> the whole project. So you want to know who are the stakeholder stakeholders uh, of that website, who uses it. You want to understand the digital environment of the project. So you you're getting a Drupal website. What you don't know is uh, is is there a CRM that connects to that Drupal website? Is there any automation that includes more than one application? Do the client has 10 other providers working on different websites? Uh, do the client have processes that go through all their different applications? So to see the digital environment as a whole gives you information about what the site should do or should not do. And you want to know how governance work for that website. And this is really important. Write this down, uh, write everything down, write the telephone numbers of who to contact if the server goes down, if the CRM uh, to which content is, is, um, is synced, uh, if the firewall of the CR CRM starts blocking the Drupal application. You want to know uh, who to call if you have a problem with the DNS zone. Maybe you're not managing it. Uh, maybe even the client have lost the email used to register the domain name. That's something that can happen. And, uh, and maybe the client forgot to pay the bill for the domain name. That's actually already happened with us. So uh, the client site was down. down uh, and after a couple, uh, I would say maybe minutes or hours of troubleshooting, uh, we, we found out that the problem was a, a bill that was not pay, paid and uh, reminders that were ignored by the client because he lost his email for registration. So you want to have a, a list of phone number and people to call and understand who manages what. Um, all right, now about the technical environment. Uh, DNS zones, who manages it, what's in it, uh, is there any uh, MX record linked to the main domain name you're, uh, you're working with? Um, is there any subdomains that are registered to IPs that uh, nobody has any ID 
uh, what what it is, and you fall on a white white screen when you visit them. So you kind of have to dig uh, for for this information. And often the client will have no idea at all of what it is. So you have to find it. A technical person that, that you can go through um, to understand everything about that. Um, hosting company. So, who's hosting the website? What kind of infrastructure it's using? Uh, what yeah type of infrastructure? And the, the uh, ser uh, service level of agreement link to that uh, hosting company. Uh, so, maybe everything is in uh, on. Um, let's say uh, an infrastructure as a service at Amazon and uh, you're hired to maintain the Drupal application but they have no one to maintain the server, the server itself. So do you need, do you need a sysadmin uh, in house to take care of this? Uh, did you cost those, uh, those, um, those, uh, those hours uh, to work on the server? Uh, do the client know what What's the difference between, let's say, infrastructure as a service and platform as a service? So, uh, is everything managed um, on that application? Uh, you want to know software and versions that are used to run your Drupal application because you want to reproduce that on your local environment. You want to reproduce this uh, on your testing environment. And you want to know every external integration and dependencies for the website. Is there any software installed on the server that you want to replicate on your site? Uh, it could be a solar server, it could be um, some PHP plugins to crawl through PDF or, or through Word documents. Um, so each integration and dependency must be uh, addressed. <coughs> and is there any build step to to uh, kind of assemble that project. So we can think of uh, obviously uh, Composer install and everything, but also for the front end, uh, are there any task runner that were used for the theme? Um, I'm thinking about SAS and LESS. Um, I've once worked on a project where we didn't have access to the previous provider and we only add compiled CSS. So where do you go from here if you don't have the SAS file? So you kind of, you, you want to look for all those, those uh, things when you're, uh, you're looking at taking over a, a new website. And then the application, the beast. Uh, you want to see, is there any automation in the, um, in the website? So you're looking for uh, rules, workflow, uh, country modules or custom modules that were built to automate stuff uh, linked to the client processes. Uh, you could look at hooks. So yeah, rules, hooks, mail. So for every Drupal hooks, there could be a, a, an automation linked to that. So if on a hook entity insert, there's some funny business uh, going on there for uh, the, the clients uh, internal processes. You wanna you wanna look for that when you when you kind of do an audit of the co code. Uh, then APIs. You wanna find uh, every API integration with either uh, enterprise software that exists out there. We're thinking about uh, Salesforce CRM, uh, maybe Microsoft Dynamics, etc. But also custom APIs that were built by maybe the client's technical team. And often you will you will you, you will inherit the mandate from let's say the marketing side of the clients, and they did not really talk to their IT guys, and maybe there's an integration where, where with their uh, ERP in house. So you want to look for those integration. Um, it could be also commerce integration. So make sure you know what is the payment platform that the client uses. Can you have a sandbox at that payment platform? libraries that could be used. And here my, my best um, advice is to kind of build a set of keywords that you want to look for when you look through the code. So at one point, uh, hopefully before you install anything, you're gonna try to look through the co custom code, custom modules. 
uh, and the theme, and you want to look for a bunch of keywords. So you can even build a script with those keywords. So I'm thinking uh, stuff, stuff that relate to external API. So every maybe every hooks and mail, Drupal mail, that are in custom modules, uh, you want to pick those up and see, understand when they're fired and why they're fired. Uh, for uh, for API integration, you could you could build a list of keywords like um, SOAP, uh, JSON. Um, you could look at uh, Drupal HTTP request that is the, the, the helper to to access external links. Um, so you try to, to build a list of keywords that you can uh, crawl through uh, the site. I tend to include as well um, enterprise software in those list in that list of keywords. So Salesforce. Um, uh, is an example, Dynamics is an example. Um, so you really want to kind of statically assess the code before installing it. And, and then the last thing to take into uh, account of the application is user-generated content. So if you, you have to move around databases, uh, if you have to change your hosting company, if you want to move the infrastructure, you want to understand what is the user-generated content and what, what does it mean if you have to um, have some content freeze on the website because you're changing uh, infrastructure. And the, the most vicious one in that category is Webform because the client, uh, a client with only Webform on their website will always tell you, uh, oh no, it's just, it's just static content. We, we are the, the only one touching uh, the content, etc. But they have like two contact forms that are linked to um, business uh, processes that they, they, they don't take into account um, when we're thinking user generated content. All right, now you can install the site locally. You've, um, you've gathered documentation, you went through the code. Uh, you asked around for API integration for business processes, and now you're ready to install the site locally. Maybe it's a good idea before hitting the first PHP page on that site to disconnect from the network. Um, why? You asked me. <laughs> and uh, so that's a true story, an unfortunate one, but, but, but it's a true one. Um, so we did all those steps, we kind of a bunch of documentation we went through, but there's one thing we didn't catch is that emails were, were sent uh, using cron, and they were not sent using the PHP ma mailer, they were sent connecting to an external API. Um, so once the site was installed locally, uh, 10,000 emails were sent to the client's client, uh, telling them that a, a new account was created uh, for them on the local host website. <laughs> so everyone click, clicked on the link, blank page, and they received uh, hundreds of emails of, oh, your email didn't, didn't work, etc. So, so even if you use something like, like MailHog that I'm gonna talk about a little bit later, uh, maybe the first time you run PHP on the website, uh, disconnect from the network just to see what's going on, uh, are there some uh, errors that show up, um, etc. Uh, so can you make the website work locally and can you make it work without being connected to your network? So that would be great news. That would mean that uh, there's no kind of um, script blocking integration with, uh, with external integrations. Uh, can you reproduce integrally your uh, collection environment locally? That would be great. And uh, can you catch any potentially dangerous external integrations? Uh, before they trigger locally or on your test servers. Uh, things you want to worry about, API integration. So then again, back to my example, uh, if a web service is called uh, on a, at a custom API built by your client, maybe the name of that API uh, uh, will not be very eloquent and you won't see that this particular API will send 10,000 emails. Um, and you can cache everything that Drupal sent uh, on the local installation using MailHub. It reroutes every outgoing emails to kind of a 
uh, web application where you can see um, uh, the, uh, w where it's from, uh, where it's going, <coughs> etc. There's a uh, Docker container for MailHub. Even if the mail is sent by SendGrid? No. Okay. No, if it's that's the... Why you want to that's why you want to you want to catch any potential dangerous uh, integration. So yeah, so uh, SMTP module, SendGrid module, and Drupal, all of those um, external external ma mail integration uh, using contrib modules in Drupal. It's a, it's a good thing to when you're going through the um, the uh, country modules. Con country module. If there's one module that you don't know what it's doing, just Google it. Go see in Drupal.org. What's that module? What's it doing? There's a you can put a snippet in your settings.local.php, which will force Drupal to always try and use the uh, the simple PHP mailer, which will force it to all go through MailHog. I still disconnect though, <laughs> <laughs> just in case. Great, great. That's a good point. So, so would it be like a settings? So the settings override the basic settings yeah, override. Exactly using how Drupal always use the the, the basic. Uh, supposed to. That's a great tip. Um, all right. Now you want to look at non-functional requirements. So you've got it installed. Uh, yay, it works. But uh, what what are other things you want to look for? Um, so, as a po uh, in a position of a functional requirements, which would be when you click here, this happens. And non-functional requirements is everything else. Uh, on your website. So first security, is everything up to date? Um, recoverability, so this is a big one because you're, you're inheriting a, a project from a client and you don't know if the client has backups, you don't know if, he, uh, if the client has kind of a, uh, a strategy to recover uh, his or her website uh, when, uh, when something happens. Uh, maybe they could be hacked, maybe uh, they, they could do something wrong themselves using the admin panel. So you want to make sure that the client has a strategy to recover the website. If they don't have one, maybe it's your job to tell them to uh, put something in place. So uh, security, recoverability, do you have a plan for the same things? Um, interoperability, so uh, also this one is is, um, is often overlooked and you, you kind of have um, stuff to do last minute to, fi to fix it. So let's say the Drupal website needs to talk to an internal ERP uh, with an API integration, and that inter internal ERP is behind a firewall, and that firewall whitelist IP that can connect to it. So maybe you don't have this information, and you learn about that like five minutes before deploying the the one function that the, the client was uh, hoping for. So you want to you want to go through this, and, and even if you got the um, the um, opportunity to work with that client from the um, let's say marketing division, you want to make sure that you have someone from IT on the phone at one, at one point to go over through this stuff. Uh, deployment process. So do they already have one? Do you have to integrate an existing deployment process, or, or do you have, do you have to build it from scratch, or to suggest them one. All right, two helpful modules that uh, can help you kind of audit the security of uh, Drupal. Security reviews to see is there any unsecure configuration on your installation and the module hacked. That will uh, give you a diff of every country module uh, to see if a patch were, was applied without you uh, knowing it. I think security review, there's no Drupal 8 release for now. Um, but if you enter the website, it's probably going to be a Drupal 7. <laughs> Unless something went really bad with the last provider. All right. Uh, can you go further than that? Uh, sure. Uh, you can build a do not list. So that could be really helpful for anyone who starts working uh, with the project. Uh, maybe you haven't secured the whole project yet and you want to make sure someone doesn't send those 10,000 emails. Um, so it's always useful to know what you should not do. It could be stuff as simple as do not use the, um, 
Drupal, uh, what's it, Drupal backup and migrate to export a database because X, Y, Z. So do not touch that module. It could be a simple do not list uh, for the time you secure the application. You could uh, build a test plan. So what are the steps you want to take to make sure uh, once you deploy that snippet of CSS, you're not breaking the, the whole system? I'm using CSS in a, as an example. I understand that uh, it's, it's not really functional, but it would be crazy right, if you just deploy one line of CSS and the whole website breaks. Um, <laughs> so you, you want to you wanna have a test plan. Uh, and you want to make the application your, your own. You want to really go into the application and remove every uh, my test module dot bck dot two thousand fifteen dot module file. You know mm -hmm. all those artifacts <laughs> that that you don't know how or why they exist on the website, and you don't want to touch them because it's not yours. That's this is the time to make it yours and to 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 delete that file. I promise you this is a great feeling to get rid of those uh, artifacts. And uh, maybe you want to go over the risk mitigation strategy that you have in place with the client. You want, you want, to, you want your client to understand that the work you're doing, the, the, the steps you take to make yourself safe and to make your clients safe are uh, wor worth the buck they're investing in your work. Um, and this is crucial, and often as developers, we don't want to, um, we're kind of ashamed that, to put on work that's not um, uh, immediately observable by the client, and you, we, want, we want that every hour that we spend is added value to the client, and yes, they will get their new uh, carousel, yes, they, they will get their new feature, but risk mitigation is value. You are bringing this value to your client. Uh, and then remember that compassion and transparency wins over fear. You want to be compassionate and transparent with the client. You want, you want to be there uh, for their fears. You want to be able to listen to them. You want to you be able to tell them to wait for that deployment because they are taking a big risk to deploy uh, this Friday 5 p.m. on a website that you've never touched before. Uh, immediately on, uh, on uh, production, so you want to become compassionate with them and to understand why, um, uh, where their fear come from, comes from. You want to be compassionate with the previous, the previous team, the, the one that built the monster, the one that built the beast. You don't know, you don't know what were the condition uh, in in which this beast was was uh, put into life. You don't know. Uh, you don't know the friction they had. You don't know uh, if um, it was given to someone uh, who had never worked with Drupal before. Uh, you don't know if the client maybe was cheap at first and didn't understand the the work uh, and the hours that we need to put in a website to make it stable and secure. So you don't want to start like using those guys are uh, your scapegoat you want to be compassionate with them because you've been in that situation before. Um, and you, will, you, will, you want to be compassionate with yourself. You don't want to put yourself in a position where you're going to fail. You don't want to set yourself uh, for failure. Uh, and that's a big thing because we always want to please the client. We want quick wins. We want, we want the client to be happy with uh, the service we, we provide. But if you put yourself in a position or if you put your developers in a position where they, they're going to fail, um, you're doing you're causing harm and, and, uh, and suffering to your developers, to your clients, and maybe to the end user of the client. So um, if you're interested about this idea of compassion in tech, there's a great talk by April, uh, April Winslow uh, about uh, reducing suffering in tech and how compa uh, compassion can, can be used to uh, reduce suffering. I encourage you to, to hit this thing. Uh, all right, so how do you manage fear? Uh, the first question of this talk. So you estimate what it takes to be comfortable working on the system. So all of these 
activities that you can do to make sure that when you're going to deploy that line of CSS, that will take you 15 minutes to, to write and, and uh, 10 seconds to deploy, you want to ensure that this 15 minutes, you've put in all the hours you needed to make sure you're comfortable to deploy it uh, without any fear. And then you want to mitigate risks using all the, uh, the strategies that I've explained before. And last, you want to stay compassionate and transparent with your clients, with yourself, and with the previous team. And now you're a happy little dog. All right, any question? Comments, insults, yeah? Uh, do you have any tips for what to actually document everything that you discover? So to document everything you discover, so one of the, of the main uh, point is to be able to install it locally. A lot of people will be uh, very happy to have all of this in a great readme.md at the, at, the, at the root of your repository because it, it's one file that uh, most of developers are comfortable opening and, and going through the points for everything technical that's a, a good place. Um, you could, so if you have a, a project management tool, often there's a wiki that comes with it. So either you use a, a Jira, Confluence, etc., or uh, in-house we use Redmine. In the wiki part, uh, we have kind of a structure to document those, uh, those information. And that's the first thing that we show to every employee that comes uh, at Symmetris is what's that structure, what pages you got to read before. Uh, entering in a project, etc. So that's a little bit different than, uh, let's say, a deployment process where you can uh, give permission to only one person to deploy the application in production. So there you're safe, you're safe because it's going to be your, I don't know, your your uh, your main developer on the project. That's different because you want you want to make sure that even the people who install it locally understands the risk uh, they're exposed to. Uh, especially if you haven't secured yet the application. So down the line, you're going to, let's say, separate configuration. You're going to make sure that when it's installed locally, it's not connecting to any dangerous API, etc. But for the time that you're not safe, um, you want to make sure that everyone goes through those static documentation pages and, and read, read them through. All right. What, so, so one of uh, one of the things that I uh, haven't delved into is uh, you've got to solve each of these problems individually. So, let's say you found a, a list of problems with that site. When you install locally, it does this and that, etc. So, at each step of the way, you want to solve those problems before uh, starting deploying stuff to 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 the production environment. In real life, the thing is, uh, the client will always try to nudge you one way, so, oh yeah, but can we get this done by... So it's always, uh, th that's a good moment to implicate the client, and to, the client and to make sure the client understands the risk and maybe is, he, won't, he, he is comfortable with taking uh, this risk, but that's make it uh, their decision and not yours. And if you kind of, um, if you succeed convincing the client that the risk they, they're taking is theirs, um, at one point you're, you're all good because the client is an adult and, um, and he can go his, his own way. All right, I uh, hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you.